Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a book called Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism by our guest, the former director of intelligence for the Capitol Police, Julie Farnham. Julie, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. So I, I, I hope to focus especially on the recommendations at the end of your book, but let's set the scene a little bit. What was your job and how long had you been on it when January 6, 2001 arrived? Not very long, right? 72 days to be exact. So yes, I was working, um, I was hired as the assistant director of intelligence for the Capitol Police. I did act as the director of intelligence for about a year, a little over a year after January 6th. Um, but yep, I had only been on the job 72 days. And this was this was not a police officer in a uniform with a gun on the beat job. This was an office job working on precisely looking for the threats, right? Exactly, yeah, I was a civilian, I had worked at the cap, uh, sorry, at the Department of Homeland Security for a little over 15 years before coming over to the Capitol Police. And to some extent, I, I, I know more from reading your book than from anything else that there's all sorts of controversy and accusations and counter accusations. But to some extent, it's clear that you warned about what might be coming and that there was a lot of resistance to taking it seriously, right? Yeah, there was. Um, I had uh, written an intelligence assessment before January 6th, a few days before, sent it up to Capitol Police leadership. It warned that Congress was going to be targeted, that people would be coming armed, that there would be extremist groups, and those warnings were not heeded. Um, and then, you know, separately, there was, I had a team that was highly dysfunctional, and I was trying to put in some parameters and professionalize them, get them the training they needed, and that was met with much resistance as well. Can you can you talk a little bit about why? I mean, a whole lot of the book is is disagreements and infighting, and it's pretty clear you have major disagreements with all kinds of people, the people working for you, the people you're working for. Yes. In the super short version, why such a mess? Um, I think it's a couple things. One, I don't think intelligence was taken very seriously. Um, and that's why I had a team that was not well trained and well equipped to deal with the all the threats that were coming in, things like that. And of course, you know, no one likes change. And so for me to come in and say, okay, well, I'm going to give you performance standards and we're going to have policies and we're going to follow them, um, that wasn't well received. Um, and then the other part of it is, is that, you know, there were mistakes made. Um, particularly as it pertains to leadership with the Capitol Police, you know, on January 6th. And I think to kind of deflect some of their responsibility and their failures, they tried to pin it on me in particular. Um, they had the intelligence ahead of time. The fact that they didn't use it, I mean, that's on them, but they didn't have, they did not have an extensive operational plan. They only had a one and a half page plan, which, you know, once you get past like the salutations and like the basic stuff, you don't really have a plan. Um, and then they also did not cancel leave for the officers. They didn't ask for neighboring jurisdictions to come in to help until, you know, the riot was at its height. So all of those things were things, you know, intelligence is always advisory. It's not operational. So, but it should be used to inform the operational plans and the fact that it was not used and we saw what happened. There's, whenever anything goes bad, there's often uh, somebody knew something somewhere, but they didn't share it enough, or it wasn't picked out from the thousands of other things they knew. At, at one point, you say in the book that you, that you warned by simply stating the facts without any particular drama. In retrospect, do you think you should have screamed? Yeah, I mean, I've gotten that question and I've like gone back and thought about it like yeah I you know I had only been there such a short time I had no reason to think that the leadership would not take me seriously and you know DHS Homeland Security for better or for worse I do feel like the leadership always did take things seriously and did listen um, even if we weren't always in agreement so coming into the Capitol Police from that other environment 
I like I had no reason to think and they hired me right presumably they hired me because I thought it was, they thought I was qualified so I wouldn't assume that they wouldn't listen or that they wouldn't take me seriously so when I hear like well why didn't you like stomp your feet and like do more to get their attention like I, I did send it to them I re I I even posted on Twitter, like acknowledgement that chief son, who is the chief of police, him acknowledging that he received the assessment. Um, so I know he had it in hand. I know he read it. Um, and so why he didn't heed the warnings that, that I don't know. I don't know either. Um, we are speaking with Julie Farnham and the book is called Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism. Um, I, I want to look especially at the recommendations at the end of the story um, because they seem relevant. The problem doesn't seem to necessarily be in the past. <laughs> it could right, happen right. again. Um, the first one is uh, to create clear guidelines to ensure consistent collection and reporting of extremist activity that does not infringe upon the civil and privacy rights of Americans. Um, how, what is extremist activity and how do you do that? Well, I mean, I think extremist activity is activity that promotes violence, that promotes hate, um, that that promotes civil unrest, those sorts of activities and those ideologies, I think are problematic to our democracy. And as far as collecting on that, and that's been the hesitation is that, you know, a lot of intelligence agencies and law enforcement, they're hesitant to do it because they think they're infringing on civil rights, civil liberties and privacy rights. And yeah, sure, there is some of that. But I think if you have clear guidance and clear policies and adhere to them, you can um, protect against some of those perceived violations. So I think that's important. Also, a lot of these threats and things are on social media and people are posting them publicly. And if they're posting them publicly, then law enforcement should be able to read it just like you and I can read it. And so it's there um, and it should, someone should be reading it. It's uh, the, the point about not violating people's civil liberties, I think, is an important one. You, you mentioned in the book there was attention being paid to, to left-wing activists who didn't seem to actually be proposing violence or any sort of threat, but who named their things stuff like shut down Washington, whereas the people plotting the violence call themselves good patriots and oath keepers and so forth. Uh, but isn't there always a tendency to focus on left-wing groups and a political tendency if you're focusing on any right-wing groups to find a left-wing group to focus on too uh if their politics are extreme even if they aren't actually threatening violence yeah i mean i think there's extremist ideology on both sides the left and the right um it's one thing to think you know something or to to adhere to some ideology, but it's another thing to act violently or act in an unlawful way on those ideologies. And so that's where I think the rub is. I mean, you can, there's free speech, you have First Amendment rights, both to demonstrate and to say what you want to say, but there are limits on that. And when you cross over those limits, whether you're right-leaning or left-leaning or extremes on either side, then that's where I think it crosses the line. And that's where I think we need to pay attention. What about prosecuting politicians who instigate violence, even presidential candidates, even before they were first elected. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't they be subject to the rule of law? Isn't it illegal to instigate uh, violent crimes? Yeah, they should, they should be held accountable. They absolutely should. And so I think that's part of the problem is that we have politicians, we have leaders in our country who have taken these fringe elements of our society and really brought them into the mainstream and given them a voice, given them a platform. And that's where, you know, hate never solves any problems. And the fact that we don't have enough people saying, hey, this is wrong, that's a problem. And no one, no one is above, above the law, regardless of the office they hold. Um, Recommendation number two is create stiffer penalties for those who perpetrate violence at protests or demonstrations. Um, and I would add, what about Congress members who encourage and defend uh, not just protests, but coup attempts? 
yeah, that that's that's a problem. Um, <laughs> everyone should be able to demonstrate and protest in peace because you know that's our constitutional right. I feel strongly that people should exercise their voice in that right under the First Amendment. But when it crosses the line and becomes violent or there's looting or you know damage of property, that's that's steps over the line. In those situations, there should be enhanced penalties for that because everyone should have the right to demonstrate peacefully. <clears throat> I, I actually have some friends who, who are facing possibly felony charges uh, for splashing washable red paint on Nancy Pelosi's house in San Francisco. And apparently a couple of drops of this paint got on a police officer. And so they're being charged with battery uh, in addition to felony uh, house destruction, even though the paint just washed right off. Uh, is it is it possible to go too far? In, in mm, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would say that that situation is too far as someone who had to investigate a lot of like um, all sorts of things that uh, not just Pelosi's house, but people on the in Republicans' homes as well. You know, like that's you can make a statement without destroying it destroying property, right? I mean, if you're splashing paint, whether it's washable or not, and I don't know if like, I'm, if, I'm not, it would be readily problem. apparent if it was washable, like it's not like, it's not your property. How would you feel if someone was splashing paint all over your, your home? I'd be pretty upset. So I, I don't actually advocate that, uh, tech, <laughs> uh, but I don't think they should be facing felony charges. Um, you know, it it seems uh, it seems extreme to me that such people should be facing facing prison terms for that. Um, the uh, the third recommendation is to work with other governments to fight hate and track extremism, including designating more groups as terrorist organizations. Um, how would you go about that? So I think you know, with the far right. A lot of those groups originate here in the United States, and we are exporting our hate to other countries. Um, and so groups like the Proud Boys, for example, um, they are designated as terrorist organizations in other countries. And the fact that they haven't been designated as such here um, seems just odd to me. Um, and then we should also be sharing information because there's a lot of particularly these like white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups that are transnational and they have chapters overseas, like we should be doing more to exchange information with other governments on these sorts of groups that are, um, you know, violent, that they're unlawful, um, and they're doing all sorts of like bad things, and particularly as it undermines our democracy. <clears throat> often, often in media reports, there's a shooting in Kansas City after the Super Bowl or whatever, terrorist seems to be shorthand for foreign or Muslim even, uh, you know, that we aren't sure they were, they were terrorists, we're trying to find out, and then they find out that they were born and raised in the United States, and lo and behold, they're not terrorists, whereas you would think terrorism was a tactic, not a, not an ethnic origin, you know, so is, is this where the resistance is to, to calling domestic groups terrorist? Yeah, I think there is some of that. You know, I think when Americans think of terrorism, they think of like Al Qaeda and ISIS type groups, but there's terrorism right here in our own backyard. And I think we need to acknowledge that first and foremost, and then we need to do something about it. And, you know, it's hard, I think, for Americans to wrap their head around that you can have like white guys um, who live in their mom's basement be terrorists uh, <laughs> and there are, there definitely are. They're just like normal um, white people who are terrorists, and we need to be able to acknowledge that. Um, the, the recommendation number four, Congress and the White House must stop politicizing government agencies that are working to keep Americans safe. Um, I hope they're really doing that, um, but how would you stop Congress and the White House from politicizing something? <laughs> this is This is what they do. Well, I mean, but they do it. They're so divided right now. Like they're not even, fun they're not a functioning body right now, Congress. I mean, you look at like the budget, right? They have not passed when we're, you know, it's February, the end of February of 2024 right now. They still haven't pa passed a full budget for this fiscal year. 
And that is like, that's basic congressional duties. And the fact that they can't get that done just shows how dysfunctional they are. And you see, um, you know, these committees, they're exercising their oversight authorities for political gain. They're not really trying to hold agencies accountable or address any issues that they have. They're just trying to like, it's just all political posturing. And that's really detrimental. Like, if you go back to the Capitol Police in January 6th, there are two committees that have oversight of the Capitol Police, the Senate rules and the House administration. But when you listen to their hearings, it's all like politics and just like it's not um, actually trying to make things better. And that's where I think we we've lost ourselves. Recommendation number five, regulate social media content and create mandatory reporting. Um uh, meaning reporting of illegal statements to law enforcement, right? Yes, that's correct. So in my time at the Capitol Police, I oversaw the investigations of um, uh, tens of thousands of, of threats against members of Congress. Most of them are made on social media. And sometimes I'd go to like investigate them and research where it was. And the comment had already been pulled from the social media platform, but no social media company ever sent a threat over to me. Um, and so they know what's wrong and they're pulling it down from their platform, but they're not warning anyone. And that's really like, that's discouraging. It's not, I mean, I understand that social media companies are a business and they don't want to be seen as cooperating with law enforcement, but if something would be illegal, if it didn't happen online, then why it's not like creating new levels or new um, areas of unlawfulness. It's just reporting what is already illegal that they're seeing on their website. And, you know, in my time in intelligence, I've seen all sorts of horrible things online and uh, they, they should re report that. They, they not only disappear things that were illegal that maybe they should have reported to the police, but they, they disappear all kinds of things that they don't like for political or other reasons, uh, despite being monopolistic public fora. I mean, my idea yeah. would be that they can only delete things that are illegal, and then they have to report all those illegal things to the police. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I could get I could get behind that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> glad, glad to hear it. Uh, okay, recommendation number six: bar non-compliant social media platforms from operating in the United States. In other words, if they don't do this, they can't do anything. I'm not. Can you can you effectively do that though? Well, I mean, there are some uh, social media platforms, and I won't name them, but there are some social media platforms that sit outside the United States. And if you think about like TikTok, and full disclosure, I like TikTok a lot, um, and I like watching all those videos, but uh, like if we're having that conversation about potentially banning TikTok in the United States, like why would we not have that conversation with other about other social media platforms that are just like festering like cesspools of hate? Um, and there are like about there... stirring up hate toward China. It's not about <laughs> yeah. It's not about reducing hate, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so if we can do it in other contexts, I think we really need to hold, particularly these foreign-based social media platforms that a lot of Americans use, and they use it for the purpose of um, um, having more extremist ideology and plotting hate and violence and all sorts of bad things. Well, that certainly goes on on media, social media platforms headquartered in the United States as well as outside the United States. Yeah, agreed, agreed. But I think more of the mainstream, perhaps not Twitter X anymore, but you know, Facebook and Instagram and some of the other mainstream platforms, they do have policies. At least they have policies. There are other platforms that don't have any policies. Um, and we can have a debate separately about, you know, whether or not those are good policies, but they have some sort of guidelines. There are some platforms that don't have any guidelines. Um, number seven, hold accountable politicians who support hate and conspiracies. Um, I agree. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's self self-evident, but yeah, we should. Uh, number eight, enact legislation targeting domestic extremism. Um, again, I worry if, if that means political views, but if it means violence, then I'm 
I'm on board, you know? Yeah, I don't think it's political views. Everyone can have their political opinions, but for violence in particular, and there was a domestic extremist um, bill that did not pass, only one Republican voted for it. The reason that the GOP said that they didn't pass it was they said that these federal agencies already had the tools but the, it comes down to like accountability and ensuring that they are exercising their authority. And then it comes down to privacy too and civil liberties, right? Because if you have good guidelines then and good laws and good guardrails, then that makes it safer for everyone. Um, number nine, start a national campaign to raise awareness about mobilization to violence. That's right. It doesn't happen. Radicalization doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you don't wake up one morning and say, you know what? I think that ideology is good. I'm going to go commit commit a violent act. It doesn't happen like that. It happens over time. Um, and there are indicators. And then there's a jump, right, from thinking about or reading about or writing about violent activities to actually doing them. And not everyone makes that jump, but those that do are quite dangerous. And so Department of Justice put out a guidebook on like indicators of violence, but it's got like 42-ish um, different like indicators. Like 42 is not easy to remember. So, um, you know, you need to have some sort of like campaign of like what are the most common things that you should be looking for. So people know what to look for and know how to report it. And how to intervene and how to help turn someone away from heading toward violence other than locking them in a cage, right? Right. And um, I talk about in the book some of the programs that are done overseas, particularly Germany and the UK, that have kind of like exit strategies for people who have been caught up in some of these extremist groups and how they can like pull themselves out of that. Um, and last but not least, recommendation number 10, educate children to make them resilient to extremist ideologies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing, um, you know, uh, uh, attacks on curriculum in schools. And like, unless you're an expert in education, like, leave it up to the experts to teach our kids because they know what they're doing. And to deny um, kids being able to learn about our past, even like the bad parts of our past, that's like, that's, that's shameful. Like we should, we need to learn from our past mistakes. I, I, I think I do like to blame big corporate media outlets for everything, but I think it's only because they deserve it. I mean, what about corporate media reporting, doing a dramatically better job of reporting on these these hate groups, these violent groups on Congress members that that speak in support of such things, on presidential candidates that instigate violence at their at their rallies. Uh, where's the where's the journalism? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think it's it's two sides, right? What are they not reporting on that they should be? And what are they focusing on that they're giving too much attention to and making a story bigger than it needs to be? Um, and, and what about Congress actually doing a dramatically better job of representing public interests so that frustration and poverty and inequality aren't such fertile ground for hateful uh, ideologies uh, blaming the wrong problems? Yeah, I mean, but then that comes down to the voter, I think, right? Because we've put people in Congress and pe people at all levels of government who don't have the community in their best interest. And they're not focused on the really important things that are important to everyday people, like you know um, the economy and they wanna feed their families, they wanna be safe, they want a place to live. Like those are the basics. And we, we put, we vote in people who you know just want to serve themselves. And that's, that's really harmful to our country. Well, I won't have anyone who doesn't fit that description on the ballot where I live in a primary or a general election. Uh, so I'm a little sympathetic to, to the voters who are, you know, are blamed for choosing the wrong person when everyone knows they're not going to have anyone decent <laughs> to choose uh, in the upcoming presidential election or in many congressional elections. Uh, and many of the districts are so gerrymandered, it's, it's only the primaries. Uh, and in the primaries, you're either not supposed to vote because it's not your party, but people cheat and do it, or, you know, there's just nobody worth voting for. 
yeah, no, I agree with you. There's a lot of places. And I think it's not just the gerrymandering, but it's also like how much it costs to run for, for office. I'm running for local office here in Arlington, Virginia. And like the amount of money I need to raise for like a local office is just crazy. And like that makes it makes it harder to run. It makes it harder for good people to want to step up to run. And, you know, it's a overall problem with our political system. I agree. Um, we've got just a few minutes left. One of the, I think, popular suggestions, uh, you mentioned that other police departments weren't brought in, uh, is that the National Guard or the military should have been brought in. Uh, what do you think? And then how do you distinguish between a military protecting an election and a military deciding an election? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, like, I don't know if we had to have had the National Guard ahead of time, but what Capitol Police should have done was to have neighboring jurisdictions there on January 6th ahead of time. Because they're part of the Council of Governments and they could have very easily leaned on um, mutual aid agreements that they have with other police departments in the area to be there and to keep us safe. And they didn't. And I think, you know, National Guard, that debate would have been less of a debate if they had just been prepared and brought other officers in. Because we knew about how many people were going to be there because we had the first MAGA march and the second MAGA march. And the third one was about the same numbers as the previous two. So like we knew how many people were coming and they weren't prepared. Um. You know, my ex my personal experience with the United States Capitol Police uh, is mostly with being arrested um, uh, numerous times um, for sitting in a Congress member's office, mm -hmm. for speaking when I wasn't called on in a hearing. Um, and the Capitol Police have been very professional and polite and friendly mm -hmm. and so yeah. forth, but, but they've arrested me. And then the charge I'm faced with seems to be completely at the whim of the chairman of the committee or the Congress member's office you were sitting in, uh, not some standard of, of rules, you know. Um, is that how it should be? No, it should be pretty standard. And like, and, and most protesters who are arrested at the Capitol get a citation. Um, you do, you, you go to real jail, though, if you've been arrested three times in one year. Um, but yeah, I mean, they they deal with that all the time. And yeah, it should be standard in like, if you're protesting, you're arrested for protesting absent, like, you know, you're climbing trees or you have weapons or things like that. Um, it should be pretty standard. Well, and that should be their job, I think. It shouldn't be defending a fortress from an, an onslaught of, of armed attackers. Um, I would hope uh, they never have to do that again. Um, we've been speaking yeah. with Julie Farnham. Uh, the book uh, is called Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism. Julie, thank you for writing the book and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.